Okay, yeah, this thing right here, right, right next to me, this fucking nightmare fuel is what that is. Also, I did my version of it. I don't know if uh, you guys like my Priscilla, but um, you know, I that's that, that's the best I could do. I censored the nips, you know, I didn't I didn't feel like drawing the nips, but besides that, I, it's like uh, that's my Priscilla right there. Also, Priscilla's a bitch. <laughs> All right, so I just read uh, volume five of Claymore. Which I was very happy to get a physical volume of because I was happy to read this actually physically and not have to read it online. There's something about reading physical volumes of manga that I just enjoy more. Maybe it's the feeling. Maybe it's the smell. I don't know. Do you guys ever just smell the pages? Does that make you happier? Does it bring you like a little droplet of dopamine every time you smell the pages of a manga? Because it does for me. Anyway, so volume 5 uh, finishes up the backstory of Claire. Or at least so far. There might be more flashbacks to continue further on in the manga. But we see... Uh, the, the progression of Claire, how Claire decided to be a Claymore, which is, uh, supposedly the only person to ever actually willingly choose to become a Claymore rather than just being, having it being forced upon them, which there's a lot of things I have to say about this Claymore organization. I talked about my conspiracy theories about it in the last volume, but it, it goes even further in this one. Uh, but let me gather my thought. Let me try to go through this one by one as, as the volume progresses here. Okay, so we get the battle continuing between uh, Teresa and Priscilla. And Priscilla, as I sort of uh, analyzed in the last volume, at least my original perception of her, is she's a character that thinks very clearly in black and white and doesn't really allow any nuance, which it seems that sort of might be uh, the way to interpret the Claymore organization to begin with. But Priscilla was someone with very latent, uh, powerful abilities who was a strong swordsman even without tapping into that Yoma aspect of herself. Same thing with Teresa. So they were kind of even on that level, though Teresa was considered to be number one. But Teresa had a lot more control over her ability to tap into her Yoma self, whereas Priscilla, while being on the defeated end of the stick was not allowing this to happen because she felt like she had to be the one to do the right thing. She had to be the one to enact this vengeance to to go along and obey the rules of the organization where Teresa killed a human, so Teresa must die. And Priscilla was not allowing no to be an answer. And so, uh, without knowing a lot of Priscilla's backstory, we get the impression, same thing probably with all of the Claymores, I would imagine, that their family or somebody close to them, you know, somebody they loved was ripped apart by a Yoma, which causes them to have this sort of, uh, to be within the scenario, to be, uh, I'm going to use the word abducted, because I seriously think that that's what it is, that this is like a, a human trafficking thing going into creating Claymores. That's just my own conspiracy theory, but it's like, it's similar to me in the same way, because it seems like, None of these people really chose this. They all come from traumatic backgrounds. They all come from losing family members and loved ones. They're alone in the world. And, uh, you know, a young, lonely, you know, depressed, like, broken person, broken girl, you know, being abducted by this group and being injected with whatever Yoma DNA, however they do it, and then creating warriors for themselves. I mean, it feels like you know, akin to like a trafficking situation. So within Priscilla's inability to accept defeat, she taps further and further into that Yoma uh, aspect of herself. And they do sort of like the shonen trope, but I actually like that they did that it, they did it this way. Well, sorry, I can't speak. I like that they did it this way, where a lot of uh, shonen tropes like you see in Dragon Ball and a lot of other things are like the percentage levels of how powerful you are. You know, I'm powering up to 50% of my full strength, 70% of my full strength, so on and so on. And they kind of do that with this like as far as tapping into the yoma abilities saying that you know you can get stronger and stronger but after you pass that 80 percent mark of tapping into your yoma abilities it's very very difficult if not impossible to come back so anybody that goes beyond that 80 percent is pretty much uh turning into a full-fledged yoma or awakening as they call it in this volume awakening into their full yoma self and priscilla does this she does this with her battle with Teresa, unable to accept defeat Teresa was even going to let her go too she even like uh withdrew her sword and everything and said you can come after me again if you want to whatever i'm not going to kill you which is a uh, you know pretty good development on her part but Priscilla just wasn't having it. Like she wasn't going to accept this as a possibility and tapped into that full Yoma self. That's where you get the nightmare fuel over here on the side. And of course, as we saw coming, or as I probably saw coming, you know, that Teresa was not going to make it out of this flashback, uh, which obviously provoked Claire into wanting to become a, a uh, Claymore herself. And Priscilla just wipes the floor with them. And her sort of transformation into this Yoma creature, I really, really 
I, I was all about it because the Yomas that we've seen so far, I mean, they're cool, but they seem like kind of disposable monsters in a way. Like they could easily kill a human, but for a Claymore, it's sort of like you go into town, you do your business and you move on. But to see a Claymore that's, uh, or see a, a Yoma that's fully awakened, that fully you know, realizes that power within themselves and just to show how monstrous and strong they really can be. Uh, with Priscilla is one thing, and then there's the male Yoma at the end of this volume, which I'll get to in a second. But to see the actual power that does reside within a fully awakened demonic creature like this, freaking badass, freaking awesome. So it's great to see it. Uh, sad to see Teresa die, though I did see it coming. And it also uh, provides, you know, the motivation for Claire into wanting to become a Yoma, and I, or wanting to become a Claymore. Sorry, I'm getting my terms mixed up. I'm just... I, I just finished the volume, so I'm like, I'm, I'm a little like all over the place. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? Now, you might call Claire just running into the man in black in order to request to become a Claymore convenient, but it actually does make sense with the narrative of the story because the way it works is that the Claymore comes into the town, does their business, leaves, and then the man shows up afterwards to collect the payment. So obviously, if she goes back to the town and waits around, eventually the man in black will show up, so he'd be there to encounter. So that actually makes a lot of sense. And I think the backstory was a good length. I would have uh, been okay if it lasted longer, if there was even more story to it, but I think it was good to introduce, well, how Claire became a Claymore, number one, and uh, that we have a prime antagonist that now exists with Priscilla, which is good to see a major antagonist in the story, uh, and also everything to do with Teresa and how badass she was, and, uh, you know, like I said, it is sad to see her go, but then again, it's like, uh, you know, you kind of knew it was coming, you kind of expected it. It's sort of like, you might call it similar to spoiler alert sorry like thor's death in uh vinland saga because like you know what's coming like you know thorfinn's story can't start until thor's is dead but at the same time while thor's is in the story in volume one you really really attach to him and you really like him but like you realize that like he's he's gonna have to go in order for the story to be pushed forward so it makes sense so anyways, then we're back into the present moment and we get Claire's uh, current setup and how she's matched up with three other Claymores in order to go and face down this fully awakened Yoma. And now because of the backstory with Priscilla, you think that the Yoma, the awakened Yoma is going to be like this, but it is something completely different and it is full of conspiracy theory and I, I just gotta, I gotta go into what my theory is of what is happening here and like why I don't trust Claymores like at all, or the organization. I don't trust it at all. Okay, so here's the thing I've been wondering since volume one. I've been wondering uh, what happens when you uh, inject a male with the, the, the Yoma blood or whatever it is and create a male claim. Like why is there no male Claymores? There has to be a reason behind it. And I was thinking it might have something to do with just like literally like testosterone, right? Like a male sort of innate desire to to battle or to conquest or to enact some sort of violence so we we have this sort of uh sense of capacity for violence that's just naturally inherent within us and it's because of biology it's a survival mechanism like males need it for survival because in throughout history through from caveman days until up until like modern you know context like males were the ones that had to go out and hunt males were the ones that had to defend their family from danger males were the ones that had to fight males were the ones that had to achieve that had to build that had to create so like we have this drive to do things that are physical which can turn into negative things if you don't uh find a vessel to sort of like channel it in but it exists for a reason like there's a reason men's men want to be physical or violent in a sense because it comes from an innate uh need to survive like need to protect need to defend need to create need to build um need for conquest you know things like that things that are just inherent like within within males that I'm not saying don't exist at all within females, but just like in a general sense, like males are more aggressive in that way and and uh, women are more feminine in that way. Like just normal, in general, speaking in generalities. Um, so it makes sense to me that a male Yoma, that uh, their ability to awaken the Yoma like within them would be a very, very strong one. You know, you could even like attribute it to, I don't know if the story is meaning to do this. Forgive me, this is just my interpretation. So I'm sorry if this is like annoying, but I just got to give you the reviews from my own brain's perspective. So that's how I do these. So I, I apologize if I'm in the completely wrong direction from the intent here. 
that you could maybe even liken it to like sex right how uh how men are turned on and turned off where like a light switch right where it's, just, it's either on or off where women is more like a dial that's sort of like the analogy they give where it's like you know you have to like warm up uh, to to get to that level where men is sort of just like more instant and I feel like awakening or tapping into that build uh, ability they even use the word pleasure when she describes it uh, I believe let's see where is it uh, when she's talking about the male uh, male yoma she was like yeah when a male releases yoma power you can't suppress the urge to awaken uh, males would pasture as uh, various eaters yep um, in a sense awakening is much like pleasure and so I thought that was really interesting that they threw that in there because I, I, that makes sense to me. That just makes sense to me, just like understanding a bit of like male and female dynamics and sexuality and how it all works and like, uh, you know, our innate drives and everything like that. Like it just, it makes sense to me that the males would tap into that power and find this sort of pleasure sense, find this sense of power within it and want to enact that power, want to be the strongest because there's always that desire to to rise up or to conquer to conquer or to be the strongest and yada 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 it's just like a, a natural thing which i thought was really cool and i actually uh, actually find like gender dynamics to be really really interesting and i don't think there's anything wrong with with analyzing them or like pointing out like the generalities of them and so that's why i always thought it was really cool to begin with that claymore had a uh, female protagonist because a lot of times in shonen material you get male protagonists because usually the stories of shonen kind of deal with that sense of like conquering and rising up and training becoming stronger yada 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 things that males really really relate to so i thought it was really i the one thing i love about claymore is that we have a female protagonist and that we're coming at things a little bit differently in that way and uh, it makes sense that sort of like female nature would be able to suppress and control that sort of like desire for awakening that desire for uh for you know like innate violence like within you because uh men and women are, are different in that way now again i could be completely 100 percent off base maybe that's not the point maybe that's not the idea behind claymore and and what they're trying to say with that but that's just sort of like the original like thought within my head so it makes sense and i was really really happy to finally see a male yoma and to see, you know, how vicious they are and how powerful they are and everything. And it, I think it makes total sense. And, and it works for me. Like, it completely worked for me 100%. But now I have to get into my conspiracy theory about this Claymore organization. Which, again, I feel like is some weird fucking human trafficking thing within the Middle Ages. So, like, uh, I noticed that while reading this, there was, like, a, she was explaining how the male Yomas work and everything like that. And the male seemed to be able to talk and communicate very, very well. And he says something along the lines of, what was it? Uh, you made a major mistake and you should know what it is. And she looks at the group around her and, um, you know, they uh, they sent this group of four girls to go defeat this awakened Yoma. They didn't realize it was a male. And when they got there, you know, they were kind of like uh, uh, just all of a sudden struck by how powerful it was. It starts like ripping them apart and everything. And they're like, what the fuck? Also, Claire is there. And we learned that Claire is actually the lowest rank Claymore of all of them, which is like pretty shocking, actually, considering how powerful she's been built up to be so far. And in the flashback, we learned, you know, we were dealing with number one, two, three, and four, like the most powerful ones. We were dealing with Teresa that was number one. And now uh, Claire is like number 47. So that was actually a pretty big shock uh, to re to re realize. But then also deliberately sending them out here, it, it means that like there has to be a reason as to why these ones specifically were chosen, especially if Claire is the weakest. And what we know about Claire is that in her last mission, in the last battle, she was pretty damn close to awakening into a, a full-fledged Yoma, and it took uh, Raki to sort of like calm her down, bring her back to her humanity and everything like that. And uh, I can't help but think that this is just another conspiracy or another ploy to put these girls out here that are like on the verge of transforming into a full-fledged yoma and just wipe them out immediately using a male yoma which is naturally more powerful than a female one to just do it instantly now that could definitely be the conspiracy theory with the organization but is the male yoma actually in on it that's the thing that's the thing did they just send them out here uh, to fight this male Yoma in order to kill them or is the male Yoma actually part of it and maybe the leaders of the organization are actually male and maybe uh, 
being actually like coherent and and fully functioning within their yoma form maybe this is like a whole like ploy in some way to sort of like keep the situation going like sending weak yomas to towns and then sending claymores out to fight them uh keeping people in fear and like you know continuing this cycle because there's always going to be new claymores and there's always going to be new yomas and if every claymore eventually turns into a yoma it's like this never-ending cycle of of something i don't know what there really is to gain from it but there's but there's something there i just i can't put all the pieces together but there's something there to do with that so i i don't know if that's the, tr the truth or what the story is trying to get at or anything like that but there's like there's some conspiracy in there where it's like the, no one actually no one in the organization actually cares about saving humanity like it's it's all like a conspiracy theory i swear um i don't know i could be wrong but anyways guys let me know what you think of claymore volume 5 i think this was the best volume i read so far uh super excited to see where it goes excited to see more of priscilla if she comes back i'm sure she will and also excited to see more of like the differences between these like male and female fully awakened yomas because i think that's really interesting and uh and kind of cool to dissect the the gender dynamic between it so i think it's really cool i think it's really fun loving this series so far uh so let me know what you think about volume five priscilla and whiteboard priscilla as well you know she's there for you guys and uh and yeah let me know what you think guys please like the video as well and comment also yeah please please help me in the algorithm last video didn't do so well so i'm really hoping this video gets at least up to like 3k views maybe Maybe if we can maybe get it there, uh, share it with other people that are fans of Claymore. Maybe we can get the conversation going a little bit more. And uh, other than that, guys, I really appreciate you guys watching. Uh, I'll be back at you with more reviews. It might be a little bit because I am going to be moving into a new location. I might not have internet for a week or something. I, I don't know. So I don't know when the next review is going to come up, but I'll get to it as soon as I can, I promise. All right, so take care, guys. Love you all. Talk to you later.